and I sure hope that you have. I um, got a phone call from Leighton a number of months ago asking me to consider doing this. And honestly, I, because I travel so much in the summer, the organization that I'm a part of, what we do is to mobilize high school and college students to plant baby churches all over the world where no church exists. 85% of the world today, they, they walk to church. Did you know that? 85%. Most people will not walk more than a mile to church. Therefore, if you can't walk to church, you don't go to church. And so our organization mobilizes students to plant these churches all over the world. And so I'm gone a lot. In fact, I'm home just a few days and I'm taking a couple of churches from Baltimore to Costa Rica to plant two new baby churches this coming week. And so when we talked, I, I just said, I, I don't know that I have time to do this. And when he began to talk to me about the theme and about who would be there, I said, I have to do this. Because as I've told you before, I've given my entire life to your generation. And I, 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 I mean this, I'm not blowing smoke when I tell you this. I have never in all of my years of doing camps and student ministries have been with a more quality group of students from top to bottom than what I've experienced this week. I am leaving being the blessed one, and I really do mean that. My wife and I have absolutely loved meeting you, getting to know you, listening to what God is doing with you, listening to your heartbeat, and I am the one that is blessed. And so I wanna thank you for that. Uh, many of you have said, how can we get in contact with you if we want to? And, and, and of course the answer is yes, you can. I, I don't check Facebook very often. I do have a Facebook page, but honestly, the greatest way to get in touch with me is through email. Our, the organization that I'm a part of, our website is nextworldwide.org, nextworldwide.org. You can contact me on, on there, and I would be more than happy. I'm very excited. I think God is getting ready to do some really incredible things in a lot of your lives. And uh, what I'm most excited about is what you don't even know to be excited about. And I do believe God is raising up a, a new generation of worshipers, and I am most excited about that. One of these days, you're gonna have a very sad assignment to pick out the tombstone of someone that you love very dearly. Some of you in here, you'll bury your husband or you're gonna bury your wife. Most of you in here will bury your parents. Some of you in this room will bury your children. And when you go to the funeral home and they, they ask you about the tombstone, they're gonna ask you, well, what kind of print do you want on the tombstone and, and um, at what kind of uh, color, at what color do you want on the tombstone? And they begin to ask you all these questions about the tombstone and you're thinking what would be a very easy assignment, it's very difficult. And the only question they will not ask you has to do with that tiny little dash in between the day of that person's birth and the day of that person's death. And did you know that whether or not you get 10 years of life or you get 100 years of life, that the dash in between the day of your birth and the day of your death is very short? And you only get one? Life for me right now is going so fast. My father used to say, life's like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the quicker it rolls. And that is so true that life is going by quickly. In fact, I've said this, that my days seem to be long, but my years are very short. It seems like I'm, selling I'm celebrating birthdays now about every eight or nine months. And so what I wanted to ask you is this, how will you spend the rest of your life using the only tiny dash that God has given you there are gonna be some of you in this room that will not live to be 50. You won't. In a room this size, odds are you won't. Some of you think you have 80 years. Let's say you do. It will come by very quickly. How are you defining the dash, the one and only God-given dash that God's given you? 
If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to look at something just for a few minutes. It's not going to be very long. But in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts, we have the Apostle Paul's testimony. Paul is standing in front of a very perverted king by the name of Agrippa. He's very perverted because he's living in an incestuous relationship with his own sister, a lady by the name of Bernice. The Apostle Paul has absolutely nothing in common with this man. One man thought he was a king. The other man knew he was not. One man lived for himself. One lived for the one true king. Paul had nothing in common with Agrippa. And yet Paul's passion for Agrippa was the same as it was for all men, that King Agrippa would one day bow his knee and worship the true God who created him. That was his passion. So you know what he did? He shared his testimony. The 26th chapter of the book of Acts is Paul's testimony. And he divides his testimony in three parts. In verses two through 11 of 26, Paul talks about his day of deception. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the world that we live in, Paul said, the majority of them have their eyes blinded to the truth of the gospel. And Paul talks about that day that his eyes were deceived. He was on his way to destroy the church in Syria. And then he talks about his day of deliverance when God knocked him off his horse. He blinded him physically temporarily for a period of time and began to make himself known to the Apostle Paul. But listen to this. This is where I want you to focus this morning. I want you to look at verse 19, or verse 16. Because in verses 16 to 18, Paul describes for Agrippa his day of definition. This is very important. Absolutely very important. And, And I do believe, because I believe some of you have told me this this week, I believe this week has been a defining moment for many of you. I think God's revealing some things to you that you were unaware of before the week. And so in these few verses, these three verses, Paul declares for Agrippa the purpose for which God redeemed him. So I want you to look at it with me. He said, Jesus spoke to me and he says, starting with verse 16, Paul, get up and stand on your feet. Ladies and gentlemen, our churches today are absolutely filled to the brim and, it's, and, and we're the one modeling this for you as adults. The churches are filled today with people who are sitting and soaking and are souring. God is looking for a generation of people who are standing and serving a living God. Because remember what I've been saying all week, that the God who created you is a God of movement. Well, if you're going to move, you're going to have to stand. And so he gives him these words. He said, Paul, I want you to get up, stand to your feet, and look at what he says. I have appeared to you to appoint you. What have we said all week long? God never appears except to a point. If God has allowed you this week to discover a little bit more about who he is, if God has used Super Summer to develop you in your Christian walk, which I know that it has, then please understand that the next step for you as you get older is your deployment. Your time has not yet come, but your time is quickly coming. I said this to you earlier this week. God is getting ready to take off your training wheels. You guys are getting ready to leave boy land and girl land and inner man land and woman land. Now, I love that land, but it's a dangerous land. The consequences of your decisions can be devastating. So please understand that if God has appeared to you, it is to appoint you to a very specific task. And here it was for Paul. He said, Paul, I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister. Now, the word minister here is not the word minister in the traditional sense that you think. 
The word here means servant. Back in those days, the Roman ships had multiple levels of holes with multiple levels of oars. And the lowest form of servant on that ship was the under rower. Now listen to this, this is horrible. I, I can't even imagine men being forced to live like this. But these men sat all day long. They could never get up to go to the bathroom and either could the men on the floors above them. And so what happened is that on the upper two floors, there would just be holes in the ground and all of human waste would literally go to the very bottom of the ship where the under rower was. It was horrible. That is the very word that Paul uses to describe himself. He said, I am, God called me foremost to be an under rower. You wanna be a leader, you're gonna have to learn to know what it means to serve because that's what leadership is. So he said, I've called you to be a servant, but look at this. He said, I've also called you to be a witness. The word here that he uses in the language of the New Testament is the word for martyr. Now, when we think about a martyr, what do we think about? Yeah, somebody that dies for their faith, but listen to me. You can be a martyr and not die for your faith because the word martyr literally means someone that testifies to what they see and hear. So you can testify of what you see and hear without ha literally having to lay down your life for the gospel. This is what I want you to understand. You define your dash when you give your life to declaring the glory of God. Did you know that less than 5% of evangelical Christians will ever lead someone to Christ in their lifetime? You see, we don't declare what we do not delight in. And if you're leaving this week without a delight for God and the things of God, I would go home and draw a circle around yourself and say, oh God, I'm not leaving here until you begin to set my heart on fire for you. Help me to understand that I was created for you. We started the week and I told you the story as a little boy about being handed a paintbrush and how I began painting the door that my father had commanded me to paint only to find out it was so difficult. And so I moved to painting three windows on the very front of my home. And I told you how absolutely ticked off my daddy was because I had done the very thing that my father had not commanded me to do. Dear student, I do not want to get to the end of my life, my only one God-given life, and have my father say, you spent your days painting windows when I commanded you to paint this door. To love God, to love this world, to pursue his holiness, to pursue his glory, for the purpose of reflecting it to the world, that is your assignment. Anything else, anything else is wood, hand, stubble. I met a really sharp young man yesterday. He said, Mr. Samuels, is it possible if I make the NBA that I could glorify God? I said, oh, absolutely. Look at Jeremy Lin. You can take any career and use it to advance the kingdom of God. The only question is, will you? Let's pray.